All right, hello there, students. Um, those of you that uh, are here means that you were on retreat yesterday or absent or something. And uh, so please pray for those who are on retreat today. You know the experience by now. And uh, hopefully by this point, we have prayed and done our silent reading. I'm going to take us through just a little bit of a guided lecture, and then we're going to get a chance to apply those skills via a worksheet that you'll receive after the lecture is over with. Let me go ahead and share my screen. If you want to go ahead and grab your notebooks, um, you will definitely need those today. And we are going to go ahead and start our second chapter. Um, I have finished, while you're pulling out your notebooks, please go ahead and do that while I'm talking. Um, I have finished grading all of your quizzes for those of you that were here. Um, obviously, I'm not here today to give those back to you. So you'll receive those on Thursday and we can go over the results um, as long as everyone has taken the quiz by that point but uh, you can check your score on Google Classroom. Check that on PowerSchool. All right, let's go ahead and pull up our notes for today. So we're looking at today, um, original sin and God's plan to redeem mankind. So this picks up basically right where we left off uh, at the end of last chapter, which was um, we as human beings are in this fallen state. We started to look at uh, Genesis. We read about the two creation accounts there. And then we also did some uh, looking at the text of Genesis chapter two into chapter three and four, which is the fall of Adam and Eve. And of course, we know the story. Uh, the devil appears to Eve in the form of a serpent, tempts her, saying that you'll be like God. So the sin of pride. And then from there, she leads Adam into sin and they disobey God and are expelled from the garden. Starting our second chapter, things start to take a turn for the better. And today we want to look at what are those effects of that first sin known as original sin. One of the things that we're going to discuss today is the difference between a contract and a covenant. Okay. Okay contract and a covenant so we'll more on that in a second and finally we're going to learn about the first covenant with a character that i'm sure you have heard of um, very uh, recognizable name in noah in the story of noah and the ark which we won't look at today in depth but we're going to go ahead and kind of preview for next meeting let's talk about a little bit of the effects of Adam and Eve. On the left-hand side, we see the state of who we were as human beings before the fall. We, of course, know from this past chapter that we're made in God's image and likeness. We get that beautiful phrase in Latin, imago dei, meaning the image and likeness of God. We know that human beings were made in friendship with God. That's our purpose, but also that's the state we were created in. Think about who Adam is in the garden, what role he plays. We read in scripture that he essentially is dwelling in the garden and God is walking about in the garden. Now, this is metaphorical image. We know that God doesn't have legs to walk around with, but rather it's this idea that man and God are living in harmony together. Um, at the time, our nature was perfect in the sense that it was in a state of holiness, in a state of justice. And finally, we clearly desired what was good. We know that we were created good. We get that in the first Genesis account in chapter one. After God makes each thing, he says, it is good, it is good, etc. And then finally, it is very good with human beings. If you haven't already, I would just suggest kind of replicating this uh, chart, make a T-chart, if you will, in your notes. Once Adam and Eve sin, question for you is, what is the first thing that they notice? What is the first thing that they notice? Someone go ahead and say that out loud. What is the first thing that Adam and Eve notice? They notice that they have no clothes, that they're naked, okay? It says in scripture, their eyes were opened. They realize their nakedness and they hide in shame. 
something changes after that first sin, which is disobedience. I don't want us to get too caught up in what is actually happening. It's like, come on, give them a break. They were just eating a fruit from a tree. Uh, that's not what is actually literally happening here in the word for word sense. Rather, this is imagery that points us towards some act of disobedience by our first parents, the first humans. There are some similarities between life before and after the fall. Obviously, we know from Genesis chapter four that Adam and Eve have children and their children have children. Each of those new creations, the human beings that fall, uh, follow from Adam and Eve's line and subsequently all of us, they're still made good. They're still made in God's image. However, thanks to original sin, thanks to that first sin by Adam and Eve, there's now kind of a barrier, a separation, a chasm, as it were, between God and man. That nature of theirs that was once justified, that was once holy, once perfect, has now become wounded. Their reason is clouded. Their judgment is clouded. They're not even able to see clearly what is good, what is best for them like they were before. And we see that, of course, as early as Adam and Eve's sons, Cain and Abel. When uh, out of jealousy, Cain kills Abel. And finally, human beings, even today, are inclined to sin. Doesn't mean that we are bad. Our nature is still good. It's just broken. But we are indeed inclined to sin, which is a, a word that we'll see on the next slide. So just to uh, give you enough time here to jot the rest of this stuff down, um, there's a big difference between life before and after that first sin by Adam and Eve. All right, if we need some more time to write this down, of course, we can pause, but we're going to move on to the next slide here. At the start of this new chapter, there are a few of these key terms that I want us to get down. And I know you're frantically trying to jot all these things down, but uh, remember, once we have that, we need to make sure that we're also listening to what I say. Um, you're going to find, especially those of you going to college, that uh, your professors don't write much down. Uh, more often than not, they don't give you slides. They don't give you things. Uh, you need to just be able to train yourself to listen. Looking at the first term, this is something that we just saw on the last slide. Um, what is original sin? Well, we said it's the first sin by Adam and Eve, and whose effects were passed down to all humans. I'm going to give us an analogy for that in just a second once we go through these other terms. Then we have this uh, long word here, concupiscence is the way that it's pronounced. Hard to say difficult uh, to spell, uh, but it simply means our inclination to sin. So we have a tendency now as human beings to fall into sin, thanks to the original sin of Adam and Eve. Next, we have the vocab word grace. Grace is the key to restoring our friendship with God. It's a free gift from God that helps us attain eternal life. More on grace uh, in the upcoming uh, lessons. And finally, just when you thought uh, we were done with Latin, we get this word that really just derives from Greek, I suppose, um, proto-evangelium. Okay. If you're looking for the literal definition, it's first good news, proto like a prototype, meaning first evangelium is the word that means gospel in English, which also translates to good news. So when we hear the gospel at mass, we're hearing the good news. More specifically, the proto evangelium is God's promise to send a savior to redeem us. So you can't redeem something that's not broken. And God uh, had no need to redeem mankind before the fall of Adam and Eve. Oh, 
Okay, if we have those all down, um, I want to give you a quick an analogy for a couple of these vocab terms, just in case this uh, is a bit confusing. So when it comes to original sin and what that is, we can think, oh, we don't change the slide. If you have Mr. Allard's keys, if you could please return those to the main office, I would greatly appreciate that. All right. When it comes to original sin, uh, we may be thinking, how is the sin that was committed at that point in time passed down? How are the effects passed down from Adam and Eve? Why should we be guilty of original sin? A good analogy is, imagine for a second that um, your great-grandfather had a great inheritance, okay? Whether it was a mansion or lots of land or a really nice car or something, and an inheritance is a gift that is passed down when a person passes away um, to someone, presumably in the next generation, okay? That's what a will essentially is for, is here's where all my stuff is going to go uh, when I die. Let's say your grandfather passed on that inheritance, the money, the car, the mansion, whatever, to your father, but your father, this is all theoretical, of course, uh, your father uh, sort of squandered all those good things. So um, he has a tendency to... Pamela Garcia, bring me my keys. Okay, Mr. Lard needs those keys really bad. Um, imagine that your father has a tendency to, uh, I don't know, uh, gamble or something like that. And so playing poker one night, he loses. He bets the, the car that your grandfather passed on to him, and he loses the car. And uh, the further along he gets into this uh, problem of his, he loses basically all of the inheritance that uh, your grandfather uh, gave to him. So instead of having the mansion and the car and the money, um, he slowly just squandered those things away. So when you were born, the question is, is your father able to hand on the inheritance that he received to you? The answer is obviously no. Okay. He lost it through foolish choices. He lost the inheritance. He lost the great gifts that were handed on to him by your grandfather. And so he has nothing to give to you. He has nothing to hand on. Okay. Yes, we can think about it in one sense that original sin causes all these things to be handed on to us, like death and suffering and uh, inclination to sin. We can also think about it in the negative sense, that it's about what we don't receive anymore. We don't receive being born into a state of perfect holiness and justice. We don't receive being born into a perfect nature. We don't receive being born into perfect friendship with God. And the list goes on and on, okay? We don't receive being born immortal, okay? We are corruptible now, and we're able to die. Mr. Kane, if you are available, can you please call 431? So that is kind of an analogy to help us understand how is it that we lose those things that we as human beings started with. Um, it's the same way as an inheritance that was lost. All right, let's talk really quickly about just to preview a little bit before uh, Thursday when we'll hopefully be able to get into the story. Um, let's talk about that proto-evangelium, God's plan to redeem and save mankind. So once it's established that human beings are wounded, they're fallen, they need redeemed, they need saved by God, um, God gets to work right away, okay? And once we make it past the initial descendants of Adam and Adam and Eve, excuse me, we get to this character of Noah. Who was Noah? Well, he was a faithful man. He was a righteous man. And we famously know him as the guy that built the ark. Okay, the big boat uh, for the flood, the great flood, which we will discuss next meeting. Noah was a chosen person because of his faithfulness. So this was a time early on in human history in which human beings had fallen into 
uh, even greater sin than our first parents, Adam and Eve. And it was as though Noah and his family were really the only righteous people left. And so, as we know, the story goes, God is going to send a flood in order to essentially purge the earth of its wickedness because of the deeds of mankind. God actually laments having created us as human beings is the powerful imagery that we get in the story. And so in order to still allow human beings to continue on, God makes this agreement with Noah. If you do what I say, if you follow my directions and are able to build and construct the ark, then your family will be able to survive and you will be the chosen family from which the rest of human civilization will descend from. He makes a covenant with Noah. Okay, there's kind of another uh, vocab word there. And it's a sacred agreement between God and a person, or sometimes between a group of people, as we'll find uh, later down the line. So this covenant is the first of several that we will see throughout the rest of this chapter, or the semester. Uh, it's the first of these agreements that God makes. All of them, of course, are aimed at a relationship. God promises to bless, sometimes to protect or to assure certain things, certain good things toward those who hold up their end of the agreement. Ultimately, though, it's not about what is exchanged. If we were only at that level, it would be like a contract, okay? Like a contract that a professional athlete has or that someone that uh, uh, at a different job or work has. Um, like the student code of conduct, okay? That's a contract. Uh, that's about an exchange of things, okay? Exchange of goods, exchange of services, et cetera. A covenant is all centered on relationship. Even the things being given are only given because they are geared toward a relationship. So Noah, as we'll see more on Thursday, is this chosen one whom God rewards with, basically that protection from the flood, why in order that human beings might grow in relationship Alaska, with God. Do you not need what I have in my hand? I just love these play-by-play -play announcements by Mr. Lard. So Noah is going to be a key character for us, as we'll find later this week. All right, as you're finishing jotting those things down, um, that is all that we're gonna actually do for today. I want you to keep your notes out. You're gonna use these notes to work on a small worksheet that I have for you. Um, that will be passed out in just a second. Um, a couple things uh, there. Uh, it's only two small sections. The first is fill in the blank. The second is short answer. And you're gonna be using the information that you had today. So. Uh, everything from the slides will be enough to help you answer those questions. Please make sure that you put your name on it. Okay, I'm not there to um, help facilitate that, but uh, we often forget to do that. And um, when you're finished, you're welcome to turn it in today by setting it in the black tray. Um, I don't know where we're at on time, but if we have any time left over after the worksheet, uh, you're welcome to read a book quietly or to work on something from another class. Uh, I do not want us to have out our devices to work on this, and I do not want us to work together. This is an individual assignment, so please respect those things that I'm asking. All right, if you need more time to write these things down, you're welcome to pause the video. Um, otherwise, we can go ahead and wrap this up and move on to our worksheet. Thank you very much for listening today, and I'll see you all on Thursday.